Hi guys, it's Doc Curry and we have another big week ahead of us with very important economic news and some major earnings. It's about to be another volatile week in the markets. In today's video, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know for this week. So let's get into it. Let's start with the economic news coming out this week. On Wednesday, we have the U.S. Consumer Price Index, or CPI, for July. And believe it or not, this is expected to increase over June at 9.1% for the fastest rise in more than 40 years. Now, you would be forgiven if you thought CPI was going to come down because food prices and energy prices have come down. You think, well, oil is down, gas prices are down, so surely inflation has come down as well. But that's not the way it actually works. While, yes, those two categories will most likely drop on the July CPI number, the problem is the high food and energy prices from June will have a spillover for effect into July because producers had to pay high prices for stuff back in June, and those items that get produced and then get sold to consumers in July get sold at a higher price due to the input costs or the supply costs. And as a result, while food and energy may have come down in July, everything else may have risen. And it may have risen to the point where it rose higher than the rise in food and energy prices. Now, even if the headline CPI number came down a little bit in July, the core CPI number, which is what the Fed really looks at in order to determine whether or not to raise interest rates, the core CPI may have risen in July for the first time in months. And this is really spooking the markets into thinking the Fed might do a higher interest rate increase in September rather than slowing down their rate of increases. Now on Thursday, we have the PPI or producer price index. And again, that is the one that's going to affect CPI in August. We also have the weekly unemployment insurance and jobless claims coming out on Thursday as well. And then on Friday, we get the consumer sentiment, which is expected to improve slightly from last month. And that, of course, makes sense considering how last month consumer sentiment was at the lowest level in history. Now, last week, we got a major surprise improvement in jobs here in the United States, with unemployment dropping to the lowest level since the 1960s and jobless claims dropping as well. It was an absolute incredible jobs report that shows the economy is strong and robust. Unfortunately, that strong jobs report has a lot of people concerned. And let me explain why. The U.S. economy has yet to face its biggest recession challenge. Now, while there's no historical precedent to indicate that an economy in a recession can produce the kind of jobs that we've been producing, it doesn't mean that there's not a recession ahead. And ironically, the labor market's phenomenal resiliency could pose the biggest danger to a recession towards the end of this year. The Federal Reserve is trying to ease pressures on an historically tight job situation and also they're trying to slow down the wage growth because if they don't, then we're going to end up in a wage growth spiral which will cause hyperinflation. So the Fed needs to get this under control. The fact of the matter is this gives the Fed additional room to continue to tighten even if it raises the probability of pushing the economy into a recession. And the bond markets continue to predict a major recession. The two-year Treasury note exceeded that of the 10-year note by the highest margin in 22 years. The two-year Treasury note exceeded that of the 10-year Treasury note by a higher margin, a higher margin, than it did in 2008. Now, keep in mind that that yield inversion does not indicate when a recession will occur, only that one is likely over the next year or two. What that means is that the central bank has some time on its side, but it could also mean that it won't have the luxury of slowing down rate hikes, but rather that it will have to continue to increase rate hikes quickly. In summary, economic activity is expected to further cool towards the end of the year, and it is increasingly likely that the U.S. economy will fall into recession before the year ends 
or in early 2023. Now, of course, this is all speculation from economists. The real question is, what is the Fed saying and what are they indicating about their rate of rate increases over the next few months and especially in September? Well, Fed Governor Bowman sees similarly sized rate hikes ahead. That means a continuous increase of the 0.75% rate hikes or 75 basis point rate hikes over the next few meetings. So the Fed is in line with economists saying that they need to continue to increase interest rates at a fast pace. Now, this is going to have a negative downward effect on the stock market because those higher interest rates mean less consumer spending and it also hurts corporations who have to go out and get loans. And all of this should cause stock prices to continue to fall. I know we've had a major bull run over the past month, but I'm going to show you a little bit later in this video some indicators about why that relief rally might be over. Now, before we get to that, though, I want to show you one little caveat around the jobs report, because as it turns out, it's not quite as good as it looked. More Americans are working part-time, which is a potential issue for the future of the jobs market. Involuntary part-time workers, that's those in part-time positions for economic reasons and not because they chose it, increased by 303,000 in July. So in other words, while the number of Americans working in jobs may have increased, their pay has gone down because they're working part-time jobs and not full-time jobs. And unfortunately, this just doesn't get picked up in the jobs report that well when we look at these headline numbers. It looks like unemployment is low, but what we're not seeing is that the number of people in part-time jobs is increasing. So overall, America's spending power and consumers' ability to buy things is actually getting worse. And we can see that showing up in the fact that advertising spend continues to slow down. And it's not just on tech giants such as Google. It is now hitting TV networks as well. The ad outlook has become increasingly dim in recent weeks in a sign that rising inflation is beginning to affect consumer spending. Walmart warned that escalated prices for food and gasoline were causing people to pull back on spending. Now, we've already seen this hurt retail stocks as their revenue and earnings has continued to decline. And the one problem, though, that we have not yet seen is despite those bad earnings, despite revenue and earnings dropping, analysts have not yet started to really lower their price expectations for stocks. And as a result, this has caused stock prices to remain artificially elevated. However, this may not be the case for much longer. Investors are bracing for more market volatility, that is price drops, as earnings estimates slump. Now here's the key. The stock market is again at risk of appearing expensive even after this year's tumble. And the reason for that has to do with P.E. ratios. A P.E. ratio is the price divided by earnings. And generally speaking, the stock market should be at around a 15 P.E. ratio. Now, as earnings continue to drop, that increases the P.E. ratio. Here's a real easy example to explain it. Let's say a company has a price of $20 and earnings of $2. In that particular case, their P.E. ratio is 10 because 20 divided by 2 equals 10. So $20 price divided by $2 earnings is a P.E. of 10. However, let's say those earnings were to drop down to $1. Well, now the P.E. ratio doubles to 20. So the $20 price divided by $1 in earnings, 20 divided by 1 equals a P.E. of 20. So this is why when earnings go down, the stocks get more expensive because their P.E. ratios rise. And to give you an example of how much P.E. ratios have risen, let me show you this chart. If we look at the S&P 500 valuation for forward P.E. ratios, these are P.E. ratios for forward expected earnings, while it was getting close to that fair value of 15 a few months ago, it has now risen back above 17, which means it's getting expensive once again. 
Keep in mind, the stock market would have to get down to around 15 in order to be considered fair value. And normally when you're in a bear market like this, the stock market will overcorrect and it will get down to a level of around 12 before it finally bottoms out and starts going back up again. So PE ratios show us that the stock market remains expensive and it does have more room to fall before we finally reach that macro bottom. And speaking of earnings, while we don't have any major earnings that are going to affect the stock market indices overall, we do have a lot of small cap stocks that retail investors invest in. So let's go over the earnings for this week. Starting Monday before the open, we have Palantir. Then after the close, we have Upstart. Now on Tuesday morning, we get a little bit of a break, although we do have EVgo and Workhorse and a few others. Then after the close, we have Coinbase and Roblox, as well as Wish and Plug and quite a few others. Then Wednesday before the open, we have Wix and Jumia. And then after the close, we have Disney. Now this is the one major earning that could affect the stock market this week. And then we also have Matterport before we get into Viru and Hut 8 on Thursday before the open. Now Thursday after the close, we do have Rivian. And Rivian is an interesting one because while the stock price has dropped significantly and it's no longer a major player in the market indices, it does affect other companies that have invested into Rivian, such as Amazon and Ford. So we're going to have to watch out for this one as well. Now, if you're looking for any good news in all of this, it's the fact that if you have put options, you're about to make a lot of money. And if you don't know how to trade put options, if you've never done any options before, it's something you want to learn so that you can make money as the stock market continues to fall, then I recommend coming and joining us in our VIP Discord where I not only have training to teach you how to trade options, I also have coaches who are going to handhold you and help you place those first options trades so that you're not out there trying to do it on your own. You have experienced traders who have made a lot of money this year who are going to help you make money in the stock market. If that's something of interest to you, you can come join the VIP Discord at stockcurry.vip slash getvip. That's stockcurry.vip slash getvip. And if you missed the video that I posted yesterday, I went over how to do fundamental analysis and how to find extremely undervalued stocks so that you can make money when the market finally does rebound. I will put a link to that video right here in just a second. I hope you have a lot of success trading and I will see you tomorrow.